Hello, my name is Tamar Friedman, Senior Director of Programs at Jewish Funders Network, and I'm happy to welcome you to today's program, How to Make Day School Affordable for All. Is it possible? Can day schools become truly affordable for all families hoping to give their children a holistic Jewish educational experience? Today, we will explore that question and explore new tuition models and structures that are being created to accommodate a wider range of family incomes and what role funders can play in making these work. Today's program will be moderated by Paul Bernstein, CEO of Prisma. I also wanted to take a moment um, before I fully introduce him to thank Paul and his colleague Hanna Olson, and I'm sure many other colleagues behind the scenes for their partnership in putting this program together today. Um, and I really appreciate our continued work together and our continued partnership, so thank you. And now I'm happy to introduce Paul Bernstein, who will introduce our speakers and get us started, started today. Thank you, Paul. Tamar, thank you very much. And huge thanks to the Jewish Funders Network for hosting this important conversation. Hello to everyone else. It's great to see an amazing group of colleagues and friends and people so committed to the work of Jewish day schools. Uh, my name is Paul Bernstein. I'm the CEO of Prisma. If there's anyone who's unfamiliar with Prisma, let me just very briefly tell you we are the network for Jewish day schools and yeshivas across North America. Our role is to work with you and to work with the schools, communities, and other philanthropists really to enable our schools to be their very best selves. And it's amazing to be able to have this conversation today. And let me just first introduce our speakers and then I'm going to just um, give a little bit of lay of the land before we dive into conversation with them. We really have a tremendous panel together today. And I'd like to welcome first Amanda Abrams, who's the executive director of the Zalik Foundation in Atlanta. The Zalik Foundation is the family foundation of Helen and David Zalik. Welcome, Amanda. Second, Dr. Stephen Lorch, who's the head of school at the Kadima Day School, which is an early childhood through eighth grade Jewish day school in the West Hill neighborhood of Los Angeles. And third, Sean Evanheim, who is a trustee of the Kadima Day School. And uh, in his day job, Sean is the founder and CEO of California Home Builders, which is a division of Evanheim Industries Corporation. Uh, Sean really is one of the leading residential infill developers in Los Angeles. We're so grateful to all of you for being with us. Um, let me first just say a few words about what brings us to this conversation about affordability and perhaps some of the wider context around it. These are really very exciting times for Jewish day schools. Enrollment across the continent and across denominations is up. Our schools really excelled in COVID. I can't emphasize that enough, how they demonstrated the excellence that they offer and the incredible communities that they represent. There is, as a result, greater appreciation of the value proposition of day schools in many places. Day school alumni are increasingly contributing to Jewish community leadership in so many ways at the professional and lay levels. And one of the most interesting pieces that we, in the last couple of years, have seen more new investments in day schools than we have for a time before, both at the individual school level and also at the community level. And that, of course, is part of what we're here to, to, to discuss. Prisma is deeply engaged in supporting and encouraging philanthropists to make their investments, to make, if you will, big bets on the success of their excellent schools. And affordability, what we're here to discuss today, is central to that effort. But it's not an issue that we can think of on its own. As we'll hear from our speakers, affordability is integrally connected with excellence and in raising the perceived value of our schools. Prisma's goal is to accelerate the impact that our schools are already achieving, to continue to stabilize and grow enrollment as much as we can, to make a serious dent in helping make our schools more affordable to more families, to advance the value proposition of day schools and yeshivas, and to continue investment in excellence, which, for example, includes ensuring that we have the excellent teachers and leaders for our schools. So this conversation about affordability is an essential part of any conversation of all of that effort on support on behalf of the schools. So we have an opportunity today to be inspired by and also to learn from the investments made by incredible leaders 
such as our speaker, speakers today. So we're delighted to be together. I also want to recognize the participants in this webinar. There is a wealth of experience and knowledge about these subjects in the group. And I hope in the second part of our conversation, when we open up for discussion, that we really will hear from you because we very much value the work that you're doing and the knowledge that you bring to the conversation. We're gonna break the first part of the conversation before we open up into two parts. First, let's start with the whys and the what is it all about? What motivated the investors to do what they're doing and what exactly are they doing in their schools and their communities? And then we're gonna look a little bit at the outcomes of the two initiatives that we are here to learn about. So we'll start with the funder side of it. Um, welcome again, Amanda and Sean. And thank you for being with us. So I'd like to hear from both of you about what drove you or your foundation to invest your philanthropic dollars and something about <clears throat> the theory of change and the investment that you made. Um, I am pleased to be sitting here representing Helen and David Zalek, who are the principals of the Zalek Foundation and who were truly the creative minds behind what we launched in Atlanta in March of 2021, which was the Jewish Community Professional High School Tuition Grant. So your question, what drove the, the foundation to start investing the philanthropic dollars in this area? For a number of years, we had been exploring ways to meaningfully drive enrollment at local day schools and to enhance excellence. And as part of that exploration, um, Prisma was a tremendous help um, and connected us to a number of schools and funders um, and research that has been deployed over the last decade plus. And we were not specifically interested in addressing affordability. We did not set out to research how to address affordability in Atlanta. We really were looking at excellence and where were there examples of driving excellence in order to drive enrollment at day schools. And that's because our principals fundamentally believe the most important way to drive enrollment at day schools is to invest in excellence. So with that in mind, we embarked on a long information gathering process. We had conversations, we learned, we listened, um, and we started becoming much more aware of initiatives that had been attempted or launched over time. Some that were focusing on um, affordability and accessibility. And we started to become intrigued by a few examples that we learned about that were focused specifically on Jewish professionals. And as we learned about them, it became, our principals started to realize that it was really unfortunate that there were individuals in our community, and really this is, is throughout the world, who have dedicated their careers and lives to bettering our Jewish community. And these individuals in many cases are not able to send their kids to Jewish day school. And if they do, it's with tremendous uh, personal and financial sacrifices that they're making. And the other thing that we realized, um, and part of this really became illuminated from some conversations we had with a school in San Diego, was that as these individuals are leading congregations and camps, Jewish agencies, if the leadership isn't sending their children to a Jewish day school, then how do we make the case, or do they make the case to parents in the community to send their kids to a day school? So we realized that these individuals not only are playing an important role in our community by serving as educators and leaders, but they're also influencers, even though they may not see themselves as influencers. The other thing that we learned um, that relates to what drove us to invest our dollars is that we realized that of our local Jewish day schools, which went up through eighth grade, less than 25% of the graduates were going on to a Jewish high school. And even in our local modern Orthodox school, which is goes through high school, it was nowhere near close to all eighth graders were ultimately enrolling in the high school. So we realized there was a tremendous opportunity and there was a drop off happening in the high school years. And that was despite the fact that in a teen's life, this is when one's identity is really being formed and social connections are being created that have the potential to last throughout their adult lives. And when teens are grappling with their own relationship to Judaism and its relevance to them. 
So with all of these things kind of floating around, it really started to become clear to us that we wanted to focus on Jewish professionals. We wanted to focus on high school specifically. Um, and we wanted to look at how we could drive enrollment and if we could also enhance excellence even better. So I'll leave it with that. Paul, do you want me to go into the theory of change now or do you want us to circle back to that? Talk about the theory of change now and then we'll come to the results later. Okay, so that all of these different data points um, and kernels of insight led us to our theory of change. So our, our belief was that if we could offer up to 50% off tuition to a Jewish high school for the children of Jewish professionals, that we could accomplish the following. And before I go into the following, I wanna just make a note. We landed on up to 50% because of some research that Prisma had collected over the years that showed that Jewish professional discounts that were of a smaller degree did not ultimately result in moving the needle, that it really took 40 to 50% off to drive enrollment. So that's how we landed on that 50% off figure. We also landed on it because when we did an analysis and asked the schools to provide data on what they were already offering in tuition discounts or in tuition assistance to the kids of Jewish professionals, it interestingly averaged to 50% off per student. Some were getting way more, some were getting way less, but the average was 50%. So going back to, to what we were hoping to accomplish, we wanted to one, grow the number of uh, children of Jewish professionals sending their children to a Jewish high school. Two, we wanted to free up money, a significant amount of money that schools were spending on tuition assistance and discounts for this population so that they could then redirect that money in their budgets to have a source of risk capital that they could use for investments that would ultimately enhance academic and co-curricular excellence or drive enrollment through incremental tuition assistance. Third, we wanted this to be a tool to attract and retain Jewish talent in Atlanta. Across the country, it is very difficult to get quality professionals, quality teachers. And so if this could serve as a tool to retain or attract talent, we saw that as a win. And then fourth, we wanted to show appreciation, show kavod, show gratitude to all of the professionals, educators, and clergy who really devote themselves to better our Jewish community. Uh, the last question is, what was our commitment? Um, the Zalik started with the commitment of funding an initial cohort, and they said, we have to commit to fund, fund this for students for the entire duration of their high school. You can't offer this and then tell a parent, sorry, after one year, your kid no longer receives it. So we saw a cohort as all of the kids who would be eligible, who were either already in high school and were the children of eligible Jewish professionals, or those who were going to be started. So we committed to one cohort, and then we went out and invited others to join us. We were very grateful and appreciative that our friends at the Marcus Foundation joined us and invested in this as a demonstration project. And then we went out and there were uh, about eight other funders in Atlanta who joined us. And we partnered with our local federation to help bring in and have conversations um, with many of those donors. The first cohort was a $3 million commitment. In November of 2021, we then committed to a second cohort. Um, that cohort was a much less significant um, financial investment. It was a million dollars, because as you can imagine, the first cohort had all of the kids who were already in school that were eligible. Um, it, fundamentally, we believed that we couldn't just offer it to new students, that those who were already in the system because of the gratitude piece needed to receive it. So there has now been a commitment to a second cohort um, and we'll share later what the results are so far. Thank you very much, Amanda. Sean, now let me turn to you uh, to tell us about what you've done at Kadima. So my um, experience was a, a little bit different because my personal experience, I'm an Israeli American, grew up in Israel after my military service, I moved to the US. And um, as Israeli Americans, we don't know what it means to live in the diaspora, which includes the importance of um, uh, Jewish uh, education. 
So when my kids went through Jewish education, we have three boys, and they went through Jewish education from very early um, age until high school, um, we realized how expensive it is and, and how unaffordable it is. Um, if, if you have three kids in Los Angeles, uh, the tuition average probably around 30,000. Um, if you multiply that, uh, it's 90,000. And if you do it after taxes, you have to make almost 200,000 just to, just, to, just to pay for Jewish education. So after investing money in Jewish education for many years, uh, at Kadima mainly, um, we saw that um, it, it did not work. It did not work to, um, to increase the number of students. The excellence was there. We, we knew from our own kids and from their friends, and I was the president of the school at some point, so I knew how good the school is, but it still didn't help. So as a business person, my goal was to disrupt how we attract families to Jewish education um, and, and how we look at tuition models, enrollment, retention, and fundraising need. Um, so like I said, I looked at it as a business and, and looked at how much we're getting per student, what's the net tuition per, per student, and, and how can we reduce um, the, the, the price that we're asking? Because what we have done, and again, this is very, I, I believe, well, I'm not sure if it's what's happening across the country, but in Los Angeles, so everyone throw these high tuition numbers, and then there is a financial aid process. Um, so if in, when my kids were in high school, the tuition was 45,000, um, they said, oh, well, we can ask for financial aid. So thank God I didn't need financial aid, but many families applied and, and at the end of the day, they may have paid 20, they may have paid 15. I don't know what each one paid, but um, a lot of Jewish families don't feel that they're a financial aid family. So they don't even consider Jewish education. It is uh, very common, at least in, in Los Angeles. So my goal is how do I, first being more attractive to Jewish families and how do we really um, sell the product for what what we can afford selling this excellence and feeling like the airline model is, so how do we fill the empty seats in the classroom? Because there is hardly any cost to fill those empty seats. Um, and, and that's where I start crunching numbers and, and looking at it. And eventually I said, we should reduce really the tuition to what we get per student. And, and some people said, well, the risk will be the people that are paying 28,000 or 30,000, I don't remember what the tuition was. And we, by the way, at the end, we reduced tuition by 45% on an average. Um, but people said, you're gonna lose the 45% from the full pay tuition. Um, unfortunately for Kadima, we didn't have a lot of full pay tuition uh, families. So it wasn't a big risk, but schools that don't provide a lot of financial aid, it, it will be a bigger risk. So the, the consideration was, let's cut the tuition to what really we get per student and let's increase the enrollment and hopefully we'll increase fundraising because people that can afford the higher tuition will step in and give some of, um, will increase their giving. Um, the increase of giving didn't work as good as, as I wanted for many reasons, but the main reason is because we didn't have a lot of full paid um, tuition at the time at Kadima. Um, but the, what we did see and by the way, when we started the program, we knew it's, it's, it's probably a five-year program to see results. We knew it's not going to happen year one. Oh, wow, everything is great. Um, so we saw a substantial uh, increase in, in enrollment in, 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 in the first few years before COVID. We started that, like, just I think Steve will, will know the exact date, but about two years before COVID. And, and then, so we saw the increase. And the one, the one challenge was, like Amanda said, the challenge was for us to commit, and that's where I had personally to make a commitment that we, we will continue this program for, for many years. It's not gonna be a one year, and if it didn't work, then you enroll your kids on first grade, on, uh, into first grade, and you're paying 15,000, and the next year you'll pay 30,000. No one will enroll the, their kids without the assurance that, um, that they'll be at the school at, at, at reasonable tuition. Um, so, so that was one challenge to sell to the community. And then I know Amanda talked about excellence is how do you say, well, I'm excellent and I was at the price of 30,000 or 28,000 and now I'm gonna say excellence and I'm gonna sell it to you for 15,000 or 16,000. And that was more of a messaging um, marketing um, uh, issue that we had to deal with. Um, and, and by the way, we got to this conclusion because we tried so many things to attract students, 
to cut expenses, to do whatever we could to make this the school um, um, sustainable, financially sustainable. And and after so many tries at so many level, I personally realized that I think this will be the model that will help. Um, so this is in regard to why I personally um, got involved in and the theory of change. Um, mine was that if Jewish education tuition will be more accessible, it will attract more Jewish families to Jewish education and will eliminate the extensive and uncomfortable financial aid process. It will increase enrollment, um, will reduce the cost per student and will ensure the future of Jewish education uh, which will not rely heavily on fundraising. It will, um, it will make really Jewish education stronger, a stronger pillar in the Jewish community and, and will ensure eventually Jewish continuity. Um, so this, this was the plan and, and we can talk later about, Steve, I know we'll touch the data, but that was how we uh, envisioned the whole process. Thank you. And can, can you share anything with us, Sean, about the sort of the level of investment that you've made? So over the years, we, we gave the school millions of dollars um, in, in, in many uh, ways of support, including we, we donate a substantial amount for the campus. But um, for the first probably year or two, we, it was, there was no number on it, really. I just said, um, Dorit and Dorit is my wife, Dorit and, and myself said that we will be there if this didn't work to, to close the gap, at least in the first few years. Um, of, of the budget. So if we projected that because of that will increase the enrollment of the school, let's say at 50 students, and we didn't, and, and we short now on you know, a few hundred thousand or a million or two in, 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 in tuition, we will close that gap. Um, we, we were willing to do it because the, the challenge, at least it's very unique to Los Angeles. Most Jewish schools are almost not making it, unfortunately. Uh, and I'm talking about if we exclude the Orthodox um, Jewish education. And, it, and it's very sad, a city like Los Angeles with so many Jewish American and so many Israeli Americans, there are only a few thousand kids in Jewish education here, which is absurd and an embarrassment to us as a community. Um, so to me, I knew that if this will not work, schools cannot sustain themselves for too long of having one or two major donors. Those donors eventually will go and do other things or reduce their giving. Um, and, and what do you do? And we know it in schools here that, that had families that supported them for many years and, and, and the family changed their mind and the school has disappeared. In Los Angeles, by the way, a great example is JCCs. We don't have JCCs in Los Angeles because they're all gone. They're all supported by certain individuals. And, and, and by the Federation. And one day when everyone said, okay, we're done here, the next year they closed all the JCCs and sold them. Um, so I don't want Jewish education to experience the same thing that the JCC models experience in Los Angeles. Thank you very much. Let's move into the results, but also what does it, what does it take to really make something like this a success? And Steve, I'll come to you first, having been on the front line of seeing this happen at Kadima. Um, how does it actually work and what makes it actually successful? Um, so first, uh, I, uh, I want to express gratitude to Sean for being the backstop of this program uh, for what has now been five and a half years. It began in the spring of 2017. Um, the, the bottom line, uh, uh, top level uh, number is Enrollment has increased by 23% in that time. Um, now, that's not super remarkable because enrollment has increased somewhat in all Jewish day schools um, since COVID began. Uh, but this also includes a couple of years pre-COVID in, in, in that uh, uh, representation. And 23% is above what the average increase in, in enrollment has been in, uh, in day schools across the country. Um, the other um, interesting uh, factor is that our net tuition per student, per student um, has risen. In other words, we decreased tuition by 45%, but the net tuition per student has increased. Um, that's because uh, we, at, at the same time that we lowered tuition, 
we also reduced the availability of financial aid. Um, and now uh, about one third of students qualify for financial aid. And I, in the past, it was above 80%. I don't know the exact figure. That was before my time at Kadima. Um, the, uh, the increase of 23% in enrollment is um, uh, really the, 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 the tip of the iceberg because the springboard for increased enrollment is high enrollment in the lower grades. And um, at the moment, uh, we have by a wide margin, uh, the largest enrollment in kindergarten ever, 43 students, um, in a school of 245, you can see that the, the impact that the, uh, that the tuition model is having at the lower end, and that will just uh, work its way through the school. Um, so what are the preconditions for uh, a, a tuition model like this to work? Um, Sean mentioned one of them, uh, namely that uh, the, the school is providing uh, a high level of financial aid, um, and uh, so uh, uh, decreasing tuition um, while lowering uh, the percentage of, of people receiving financial aid and the availability of financial aid um, will not have a significant impact on the uh, net tuition per student. And then the other precondition uh, is that uh, there are a significant number of empty seats. Uh, if you have full classes, uh, lowering tuition uh, will be a, a um, benefit to the, the, to the community, but it won't be a benefit to the school. Um, the last um, uh, outcome that I want to mention briefly uh, is that in our experience, low tuition uh, is, not the, uh, is not the draw. Uh, families do not come to Kadima right now saying, oh, we heard about your affordable tuition um, and we want to hear more about the school. Um, parents come to uh, Kadima, prospective parents come to Kadima, like they do to most schools saying, oh, we heard from another family that Kadima is a great school. Tell us about it. And then when they hear about the tuition, um, that becomes the clincher. Um, now, I think this is uh, the situation um, and would be the situation in non-Orthodox schools. Uh, in Orthodox schools where, um, they, uh, uh, where families basically know that they're going to be coming to um, a day school or yeshiva no matter what, um, uh, the, 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 the value pro proposition doesn't need to be sold uh, just in terms of, of um, you know, uh, why should you send your child to a Jewish day school? Um, there, the, 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 the differentiator uh, could very quickly become um, what's the tuition level. Um, and so in, um, in the recent past, uh, schools like uh, Yeshivat Atid and Westchester Torah Academy uh, that um, uh, put a stake in the ground and said, our tuition is going to be lower, uh, a lot of their influx of students uh, uh, came as a result of that. Um, and of course, their different model of education. Uh, for us, we didn't see that. We didn't see, even though we advertised the lower tuition, um, uh, as most people know, uh, advertising for Jewish day schools results in awareness, but it doesn't result in an influx of students. Um, the influx of students comes from word of mouth, and the word of mouth was not um, about the lower tuition. That wasn't front of mind for current parents of, of Kadima. It was, our child is having a wonderful experience. You should try it. And so um, we discovered that uh, the, the affordability of the school uh, was not the draw, but it was the clincher. Thank you. And I just want to comment on your humility on behalf of the school and on behalf of Sean and Dorrit that a 23% increase in enrollment is way, way, way more than the average for the field. However much we celebrate 
what's going on in the field. I just want to say Kala Kavod for such an extraordinary growth. Amanda, let's turn to you in terms of the uh, the results. And also, if you wouldn't mind, just to sort of comment on what you're seeing on the denominational question that Steve also just raised as well. Absolutely. So Steve and Sean mentioned that their program in Los Angeles has been going on for five years. So there's more data, there's more of a runway to analyze and learn from. We just launched this program in Atlanta in March of 2021 for that first cohort who was starting school in August of 2021. So the first year in reality, we didn't truly have a tremendous opportunity to enhance or to um, influence enrollment. So we are not even two years in. So keep all of what I'm sharing in mind that it's still uh, very early lessons learned. First results on the appreciation front. People who receive this, whose children receive this, felt so appreciated. Um, there's an article that I'll be um, that will be published in Prisma's journal um, in the future that goes a little bit deeper about the JCP program, and we've shared some quotes. But when you read the appreciation that some of our communities, educators, and rabbis and professionals have shared with us about how this is the first time in their career of 20, 30 years that they ever felt appreciated for what they did, it, it, it really breaks your heart and warms your heart at the same time. So on the appreciation front, we feel that this has been very successful. On the recruitment and retention front, um, there's been some really interesting learnings. Um, there have been people who have moved here that work for national Jewish organizations and that have moved to Atlanta so that their children could receive this. We have people who've moved here from other communities to work for our local Jewish organizations so that their children could receive it. And we've learned of people who were previously educators, um, early childhood educators who left the field at a certain point, their kids were older, who came back, um, re-entered their role as, a, as an early childhood educator so that their kids could receive it. And one of the interesting thing is we've learned of people who are in the for-profit sector or working in non-Jewish nonprofit organizations who've transitioned to work within our community in marketing or finance um, or as a social worker. And they were incented by the opportunity for this their children to receive this grant because it's, it's, it's very meaningful um, from a financial perspective. We have heard from some self-reported that they've stayed at their jobs, but clearly it's more challenging to gauge retention when you're asking someone, were you thinking about leaving your job and did you happen to stay? People are often less inclined to want to self-report that. So that's one that we're, we anecdotally have heard of people staying because of it, but, but I couldn't tell you with assurance. One of the surprising um, successes of this, of the results, has been the reinvestment fund. Um, over the, since this launched, over the last uh, year and a half, $1.8 million dollars that had been previously spent at these three schools that are participating, the eligible schools, they'd been spent on tuition assistance or discounts for children of Jewish professionals, has been reinvested into efforts that are intended to drive enrollment. Um, they're focused on, we had parameters and strings attached as we say, um, for what the schools could or couldn't reallocate the money into. And we have a committee of um, funders and day school investors in our community who look at the reinvestment plans every year, follow up with questions or ultimately sign off. And schools have been able to hire new personnel. They've been able to do academic enhancements, co-curricular enhancements, technology upgrades, professional development. And what we learned is that many of the non-Jewish private schools in our community have six and seven figure dollar funds that they have set aside where if the school is looking to experiment or innovate, they go to these funds and they actually proactively go to their teachers to say, what are the new ideas that you have? What are the things that you want to experiment with? And our day schools, for the most part, have not had that same source of funds. And this has created a source of risk capital for them, which has been a tremendous success. Um, we also learned that their boards are often reticent to invest into something that's risky. And so by the requirement of this grant, um, saying that it has to go into something that is going to drive excellence or enrollment, 
it gives the heads of school permission to say to their boards, like, we can take some risks because we have to. So there were some, some strings attached that proved to be helpful to the heads of school. On the enrollment front, um, it's been mixed across the board based on denomination. So in our community, there's a school called the Weber School that's uh, a community high school. And that school is where we've seen the most growth on the enrollment front from the Jewish community professionals. Um, in the ninth grade class, the enrollment of children of Jewish professionals from before this started to the freshman class today, it's grown by 50%. And overall enrollment of children of Jewish professionals at the school um, has grown as well. At our Orthodox Girls High School, the enrollment has not changed. And as was discussed um, by Steve, that's an audience that's here. It's more demographically driven than it is going to be driven by this discount. But I will say the parents of the girls at this school were so appreciative. Uh, we had a couple of parents that shared anonymously. This is the first time in their life they've been able to put away any money for their retirement or to pay off a loan that they had. So for them, the, the financial piece was instrumental. Um, and at our modern Orthodox high school, we have also not seen um, the enrollment overall grow. So the enrollment piece, again, it's still early, but it's 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 been mixed and more impactful at the community school. One other piece I wanna share just in terms of results, um, we embarked on an advertising campaign in January, February of earlier this year in 2022 in partnership with our local federation. And with um, some advisement from Prismo, we honed in on four or five communities that didn't really have um, a robust Jewish high school. And so we targeted ads on different social media platforms to try and incent Jewish professionals to perhaps move to Atlanta and take advantage of this. And we did not see any results in the applications from the current freshman class that were driven by these ads. It's not to say that they weren't impactful or maybe they didn't catch some eyeballs that will result in applications in the future if this continues, um, but we didn't see any direct applicants for this current freshman class by virtue of that advertising campaign. And then the last piece I just wanna share based on results um, for anyone considering something like this, we made a decision, um, the Zalek Foundation, to invite others to invest in this and also to be part of the oversight and the governance because we really see this as a, a resource uh, for our entire community. And having that oversight committee has been so helpful and so important that this is not just a Zalek thing, this is a Atlanta Jewish community thing. And that when there's questions about eligibility or process or there's questions around um, do we keep moving forward? Do we scale back? There's a group of um, thought partners that we can go to and talk through these, these tough issues. Thank you, Amanda. If I could just, I'm um, just looking at some of the questions that we have in the chat and I encourage anyone else to put them there or actually we'll open up and you can uh, raise your hand. We'll come to other questions, but there's a few there to start. Amanda, let me start with you. There's some definitional questions that are coming up. One around, how did you arrive at the definition of who is a Jewish communal professional? And maybe connected to that, question around uh, given that focus what what does it mean for non-jewish teachers do they feel in any way um negatively impacted by that and then uh, uh in addition to that did you think about going beyond the high schools okay great question so the first one how did we define jewish professionals that committee that i just referenced helped us with that. Um, we came up with kind of a straw man of what the definition was and then ultimately refined it to get to a place that we felt was clear, um, was fair, uh, was mm -hmm. representative. And if you are curious about what it is, if you go to any of the school's websites or if you reach out to me after, I'm happy to send you the eligibility criteria where it's very specifically stated. I'll give you one example. We said a, an organization has to have been in existence for at least three years because we didn't want people to be creating these new 501c3s as a way to somehow like skirt the issue. Um, so there's that's just one example. Um, the question of do non-Jewish faculty or teachers 
or professionals for that matter in the community feel slighted. Um, I, I'm not aware of it, but it's not to say that that isn't happening. We just, I don't think we are, we have been told that that's, that's an issue. It's a fair question. And then uh, the last question was, have we considered expansion to other grades? Mm -hmm. um, yes, and we've done the analysis. We've looked at six through eight, what would the cost be? We've looked at um, K through five, what would the cost be? We've looked at K through eight. And ultimately right now, and I can't say that things won't change in the future, but right now we feel like we still have um, learning to occur with the high school. And it's still, I think, a bit early to say, all right, this has been a success on you know goals A, B, and C. And so now we want to roll out and really hone in on those, or it hasn't been a success on, on you know goals you know, D and E. So we've looked at it. We have a, some projections on what the costs would be, but we have not rolled it out. And we have actually been approached by individuals in the community who said, would you consider rolling this out for preschool? Or would you consider rolling this out for summer camp? And in some of the situations, we have to go back and really ask the core questions of like, what are we trying to do? And, and, and when we look at those questions, I'll, I'll say, for example, camp, um, fully believe at the Dallas Foundation, we're big supporters of camp, but ultimately came to the conclusion that we weren't sure that offering this would increase enrollment because our belief based on the data was that children of Jewish professionals who are inclined to send their children to camp are already doing so. So we've really tried to also stay data driven. Thank you. I'm seeing quite a number of questions that are very specific data questions. Forgive me for not trying to go through all of them, but I have no doubt that any of our panelists would be happy to, um, to answer specific questions afterwards. Um, and you can reach out to them via us at Prisma if it's helpful to you. But a couple of things that are catching my eye. One is, uh, maybe I'll turn to you, Steve and Sean, sort of questions about the long term. How do you think about this in the long term? How do you message it for the long term? Are you thinking about endowment as a, as a route? And a second one actually on the enrollment side is around um what's the what's the where there are multiple schools in the catchment area is it attracting from other jewish day schools is it attracting new families is it attracting from public schools what are you what are you, or other independent schools what are you seeing as the dynamics thinking about the long term and where what's the catchment so so paul i can touch a little bit the um the concern about other jewish schools so our mm -hmm. goal was never to attract from other jewish school was as a matter of fact to increase um the enrollment overall and if 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 we wanted to put any pressure on other school, it's really if, if our model will be successful that others will look at it and, and uh, see how it works. Uh, I know that in the first few years, we didn't attract uh, hardly any students from other Jewish schools. And again, the goal was to a lot of Jewish families won't even, they won't look at private schools period because they can afford the 30 and 40,000, even if someone will give them a discount slash financial aid. So making the price tag more accessible uh, opened the door to a lot of Jewish families in our area to even consider going into a private school. And, and if it is, then going into a, a Jewish school. Um, as far as the, the specific data, again, Steve knows the data better than I know, but the, the vision was never to uh, impact any schools around us, if anything was to have them, and by the way, we had a lot of discussion with those other schools. We did inform everyone before we made it public of what's coming out. We encouraged them to consider it themselves. Um, we knew, as again, as a businessman, I looked at it as this model would be successful. It's gonna be a very simple process to look at other Jewish day schools, and by looking at their budget, their fundraising uh, line item, and their tuition, we can tell very quickly if it's going to work for them or not work for them. Um, th this model will work for schools that provide a lot of financial aid. And if schools that are dealing with financial aid know how extensive the process is, how, how much time the whole administration uh, spend on it, how many parents get upset because they didn't get what they were hoping to get. And then you have this whole thing between parents as you know, some parents that shouldn't get financial aid get it. So you eliminate a lot of that by this model too. So there is a lot of other impacts um, that, that we get to through this model. So I'll, I'll jump in and, and quickly go through the, uh, the statistical questions. Um, the uh, net tuition increased by about 15%. It was about 11.8 at the time. 
um, and it's now 13.6. Um, and that's beating the tuition increase over that period, which was about 10%. So it's about 5% above the tuition increase is the net tuition increase. Um, and then the other, the other statistical question was um, how much of the bump in enrollment is COVID related? Uh, and the answer is um, about half of the in increase, 11% came before COVID. Um, then we had a tuition, uh, sorry, a, an enrollment decrease um, uh, in the first year of COVID and bounced back and, and now increased another 12% beyond that. Um, uh, I'll just uh, um, uh, reinforce uh, Sean's point about uh, the the enrollment, the increased enrollment is coming from uh, primarily uh, public schools. Um, uh, the um, net change um, in those who come into Kadima from other day schools and those who leave Kadima for other day schools. It's just about a wash. Um, and so the increase is coming really pretty much exclusively, 98%, 99%, something like that uh, from other public schools. And it's not because of the, the quality of the other public schools, uh, of the public schools. They are, um, some of them, many of them in this catchment area are high quality. Um, and they're also uh, competitive charter schools as well. Thank you. And I also want to just recognize that the, the extent to which, particularly when you're looking at the year on year dynamics, how much is also affected by local conditions. Some of what Steve was describing are dynamics that affected the LA community. And I remember in particular that when um, schools in many parts of North America, Jewish day schools in many parts of North America were reopening their doors in September 2020, uh, among the earliest schools anywhere to do that, that um, in LA and across the West Coast, there were challenges beyond some driven by policy, some driven by the fires that uh, in that particular fall, I remember were very difficult. Uh, if anyone uh, wants to raise their hand and ask other questions rather than put in chat, we've, we've got a few I saw, five more minutes. Paul, I saw a question I'm happy to address. Sure, go ahead. You asked if Jewish professionals were previously receiving on average, I wanna make that clear, on average 50% plus or minus tuition discounts, what was the net benefit? Was it transparency. So it was really interesting. We had conversations with all the heads of school. And one of the things that we learned confidentially was that several of them had attempted previously to introduce significant Jewish professional discounts or increase the Jewish professional discount they already were providing. And they got pushback from their boards who just felt like it wasn't a population that they needed to be focusing on or should focus on. So the, the, um, compromise was that they could offer a discount or have a significant um, set of funding set aside, but it was under the table. And so, yeah, transparency was a big benefit. But the other thing that we learned was that many of these professionals, they don't want to come forward and ask for special assistance. They don't want to ask for a special case. Sometimes they feel embarrassed. Sometimes they feel like it's unethical to ask for, for special treatment because someone else is clearly in a worse situation or likely in a worse situation than they are. So putting this out there that everyone, regardless of income, you don't have to fill out a financial aid application. We're not, they're not asking for your, your tax return, can receive this very generous discount. Yeah, transparency was was key. And it also, how do you show someone gratitude and appreciation for what they're doing if it's all covert and under the table and you have to go through this process, which is really arduous and oftentimes is, is demoralizing for people. So part of it was transparency and part of it was the idea of it, it makes a, an important statement. I'm gonna ask one last question as it applies to Georgia and to, and to California. Um, is, is there any state scholarship funding available that affects your thinking in either state, like there are in others, for example, in Florida? Uh, uh, Amanda, let me come to you, and then Steve will come to you after. Yes, in Georgia, we do have a state scholarship organization. Um, the Federation runs a separate nonprofit called the Olive Fund, and individuals can contribute. There's a tax credit, and then 
families who are looking to receive tuition assistance can apply, and then ALA fund becomes an additional source of funding. But there's an income cap on it. Um, some people, because of perhaps maybe their spouse's income, or it could be their own, depending on what they're doing, they may not be eligible. Um, but it also, by freeing up this money for the Jewish professionals, schools could also, in theory, allocate more Aleph money toward other families um, that perhaps they were able to offer less previously. But yeah, there's a, a very meaningful state-funded program in Georgia. Thank you. For California? Steve? Uh, there, there is no uh, state-funded program, um, and uh, there is a small amount of federation support for tuition assistance, but uh, small. And I'll, we'll take one more question. Yeah, just, just going back to the, um, the funding, I guess this is for Sean and Steve. You know, one of the things we have, we do is extensive affordability stuff here in New Jersey. Um, and we get this question like, well, how long is this going to be there? So somebody coming into a school in kindergarten, they, they have this wonderful fund and they say, well, okay, is this gonna be here when I'm in eighth grade? You know, or so I guess, Sean, since you're the funder of this, you know, have you done anything long-term to, you know, in, in Atlanta, you're doing cohorts or you got four years, you can do the funding, right? Um, what are you doing and what are you telling people when they come in the door and say, is this lower tuition going to be here in eight years when my kid, my second kid's going to graduate? So, so as I indicated earlier, we did say that this is a long term. It's not, it's not a one year or two year or pilot. This, this was a major change, and it's going to stay there. the The only reason it's not going to work is in any other model. If if kids will not enroll in 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 Dukadima and other Jewish education, then the schools will shut down eventually. No school should operate for long time under the funding of one donor. Um, it, it's not a sustainable model, and that's why we've done it. So to answer the, the specific question is the, the commitment was a very long term. Uh, we, we had no plan, and I, as a supporter of the school, has no plans for the school to jump its tuition again to what it used to be. Um, and, and I believe the model will work, it is working, but if it didn't work, then that probably would have been the end of the school. Uh, unfortunately, some schools already closed in, in Los Angeles, but I'm not saying it that the, in any way that it was risky because if we wouldn't have done it, the school would have closed anyhow at some point. Um, the school is not sustainable at the model it, it ran and many schools in Los Angeles are not sustainable at the model they're running now. I'll, I'll just add that the sustainability of this model uh, comes from the increased enrollment. Full classes at um, even the discounted tuition that we have now creates a sustainable school. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, capacity utilization is another form of affordability. Yeah, I agree with that. Right. Thank you so much for the questions. Thank you for the comments. There are a couple of things that I just wanted to, of the many points that you all made, that I just uh, really struck me. One, what you were just talking about, which is that it is a long commitment that you are all making to these programs. And that's really important, partly because I do think it takes time for awareness to build and therefore the impact to um uh to be felt connected to that of course is to be successful inviting others into the room to be able to support these programs is incredibly important and i something else that i know comes up often in these conversations that um that you really talked about is the substitution effect for some people it's well if i give this money to the school aren't i just substituting for existing dollars and that ability uh, Amanda, as you expressed it, for schools to reinvest in risk, reinvest risk capital is something that we see in a number of places and it's ex extraordinarily important. So really thank you for all of your contributions and the conversation. This is a conversation that I hope we will be able to continue in many places. Um, uh, for those who will be at the JFNA General Assembly next week, we actually have another conversation about affordability uh, where we are looking at some other community models uh, that's next Monday afternoon in in Chicago at the GA, and you would be very welcome. We have a different panel. Unfortunately, you have to see me again, but there's a different 
group of panelists for that discussion. Um, Amanda also mentioned Hayidion, which is the Prisma magazine. The next edition is coming out in the next few weeks and will be focusing very specifically on affordability intuition models, um, uh, not just the ones we talked about, but others. And we are actually, the, the, the importance of really understanding and analyzing what's happening, what is successful, and frankly, what is not, is in, extraordinarily import, important for us. And we actually have a study in the field at the moment about tuition models, which is being conducted on behalf of Prisma by Rossov. Um, so if you see something asking for information on that and are able to contribute or pass it on to schools to contribute, please do, because that will be um, so valuable to us. Our work in this area as Prisma continues. For those of you who don't know Amy Adler and Dan Perler, who lead this work, um, they're on this call. Feel free to reach out to them or to Hannah Olson, our Vice President of Development. They would all be very happy to talk about any aspect of this. I want to thank Amanda, Sean and Steve for all your contributions in this conversation. Also, I want to say a special thank you to Helen Zalek, who is on the call, to thank Helen and David for your leadership, for your generosity and your commitment to the schools. Really, thank you. And uh, to thank the team from the Jewish Funders Network, particularly Tamar and Alana, who have been such, who are such great partners to us in advancing the conversations. Uh, and before I hand back to Tamar, just thank you to all the participants in this call, both for being here, but also for all the work that you do in your communities and for your schools. Tamar, back to you. Thank you so much, Paul. I want to echo all those thank yous. And thank you, Paul and, and Hannah and Amanda and Steve and Sean for being part of this and all of you for, for showing up and participating in all the work that you do um, beyond, beyond this. Um, like Paul said, I'm also very happy to help connect you with the speakers and the other people that you might see that are here on the line. That's really important. One of the reasons why we wanted to have this meet in meeting format is so that you can see other like-minded funders and hopefully connect offline because we know a lot of the really important work happens in small conversations and large conversations, not at these larger meetings. So please be in touch if I can be helpful to connect you with anybody and looking forward to continuing to learn with all of you in the future. Have a great day um, and stay well. Thank you all.